I want to tell you a little story about scientific literacy and why I think it is important globally, but especially in the developing world. But let's first start to look at these posters, which were billboard all over the United States last year. They look pretty innocent, don't they? And that's because I've blanked out the slogan, vaccines, not the risks. So this is one of those anti-vaccination posters that you see um, popping up over and over again. Um, if you live in that part of the world. And, of course, we know vaccines have risks, but we should know, and we should have learned this in school, that the benefits of vaccinations far outweigh the risks. And it's not just about the choice of vaccinating yourself or vaccinating your child. Because if you vaccinate your child, so is the logic. Um, that child doesn't get sick, so that's great. So if I don't vaccinate my child, maybe it gets sick, but I don't have the risks of the vaccination. But it doesn't work like this, because the responsibility goes beyond yourself. Um, with vaccinations, when you vaccinate a population above a certain fraction, you get what's called crowd immunity. And that means that a disease agent, if it infects one individual, it doesn't find another susceptible host, and therefore it cannot complete its life cycle, and therefore it dies out. So this is how we get rid of diseases. This is how smallpox was eradicated. And this is how measles got eradicated. Or so we thought, because measles is now coming back, thanks to these kinds of slogans. So we should look carefully at anti-vaccination messages. Taking, it, t taking this together, scientific literacy is important, but it goes much beyond the vaccination thing. If, if a country as scientifically advanced and supposedly literate as the United States can fall into this trap, what do we suppose will happen when scientific literacy is tested on the developing world? The Ebola crisis of last year may serve as an example. Simply put, the population was initially not well informed how to behave around infected individuals, or how to spot the symptoms. And as a result, the disease spread rapidly throughout the region and indeed caused mass hysteria worldwide. And while these pictures of Ebola might be um, sort of very striking for you right now, Ebola really is not that big a deal in the grand scheme of things when you look at diseases or causes of death in Africa. Number one, HIV AIDS, about one million deaths a year right now. That's closely followed by respiratory infections. Then we've got diarrhea, we've got malaria. I could keep going on the list. Ebola is this guy down in the bottom, 3,000 deaths. It doesn't even um, cover 1% of any of the four major players. So let's better look at some of the bigger players. Malaria, for example. If you go on worldmapper.org, you can generate these really quite instructive maps. Here you can take any open statistics that's on this particular website, which has a lot of statistics, and you can put it into these maps and distort the maps according to prevalence of particular thing. For example, if we do this for malaria, it looks like this, right? Massively out of proportion, the African continent, the dwarfs even largest part of Asia. Okay, so surely at this point we might think, okay, malaria is all over Africa. Surely you would want to locate your research labs looking at malaria, researching this disease, also in Africa. But if we actually look where research is done in the world, a very different picture emerges. So at the time when this statistic was taken, if we, leave, uh, if we leave out South Africa and Egypt and just look at the bulk of the rest of the continent, the research output is roughly equivalent to that of Slovenia. So this is crazy, of course, right? So what's the problem? What's happening? Is it because there's no universities in Africa? And of course, that's not the case. There's universities everywhere in Africa, as in every country on this planet, more or less, probably. Yeah, entirely. So what's the problem? So what do these student universities deliver? Well, the key problem is that these universities, they're very much focused on the core subjects that are needed in any society. They're training medics, they're training lawyers, and they're training civil engineers. And of course, all the other subjects that are out there, they're also represented, but they're falling massively into the background. So what the problem about this is that um, if you don't train scientists or any other discipline, for that matter, then you won't have a culture of that particular discipline in your society. And then when it gets, comes to points like scientific literacy, when it really gets tested, um, you really have nowhere to start from. And ultimately, all of this becomes an issue of scientific literacy in the population. So what can we do about this? So traditionally, when we think of education aid, um, most education aid has been put into, the, um, into schools at this point. And uh, the logic is very simple. It's simple economics. Research has shown again and again that if you invest $1 in education, the lower down the educational chain you invested, the more effective it will be in the long run. 
right? So you invest in primary school primarily, and a little bit in secondary schools and universities are basically left out, out of the bargain. And the hope in this particular approach is that um, if you invest in schools, you get a more scientifically literate population growing up. They will become part of the general public, as, they, as, as it were, um, and then take the country da up from there. Um, and of course, this is an approach that works, and it's been done for many years, and of course, there have been benefits. But I will put to you that this is not the only way we can do this. After all, we already have a very small fraction of active scientists in each of these populations. So what if we could take those scientists and lift them and encourage them and allow them to do truly internationally competitive research, to go to international conferences, to really be part of the global production of knowledge, in the hope that then these guys can feed back into the population and lift the country from the other side, lift it from above. So in 2011, I found myself in this little village in Uganda. It's very close to the uh, border of the Rep Democratic Republic of Congo. It's called Ishaka. And in this little village, there's a university called Kampala International University, the biomedical campus. And I was there because I wanted to join a project, a teaching project, that was put together by two friends of mine, Lucia and Sadikia, who had in fact met many years before that. They had met at a conference in the States where they discussed the state of science in Africa. And they concluded that already a very small input, a little help, introducing state-of-the-art techniques, introducing cost-effective model systems, could make a massive difference to the scientific lives of the scientists that are working at this university and others in Africa. So I joined the project, and we had a course. It was a three-way course on neuroscience of Drosophila. Um, why? Just because that's our own expertise, so we figured we'd start at that point. So we, we held this course. I'm here hiding in the background. And um, so we were doing this course, uh, and we were very quickly realizing that indeed it was being very effective. And as the course was starting to come to a close, we kept getting questions from our students. So where can we go from here? Where's the next course going to be? What's the next steps? But of course, we didn't have a next step at that point. So we sat down and we thought, OK, let's found an NGO. The NGO is called Trend in Africa. It stands for Teaching and Research in Natural Sciences for Development in Africa. So we started in Uganda in 2011. Uh, we set up a little website, and soon enough, we started getting emails from all over the world of other scientists who wanted to contribute, which means that by now, about four years on, uh, we are truly international. We've got members on four continents, and we've got active projects in over a dozen African countries. So what are those projects? Well, we, we try to stay close to our roots. We start to focus on young academics that have just finished their master's, maybe just finished their PhD, and slightly above that. And we, we want to um, empower them to really become part of the uh, global production of knowledge. So we continue to do courses. We've branched out on courses. We don't just do neuroscience anymore. We now do molecular biology. We do scientific writing, bioinformatics. Basically, whatever you can find instructors for, we will do a course on it. On top of that, what we do is we go through our own research departments here in Germany and elsewhere in the Western world. And we find equipment that's not being used anymore, but it's perfectly workable and we ship that equipment to our African partners so that we can build infrastructure so that real meaningful research can be done also there using this equipment. And we also encourage what I like to call a do-it-yourself do methodology to, to, to doing your research. Um, so let me, let me explain what I mean by that. So as scientists, we've always had to build our own equipment. This is a very old tradition. Right? After all, we're supposed to be pushing the boundaries of what's known currently forward. And more often than not, the machines that allow us to do that are not there yet. Either they haven't been invented or they haven't been built. But as more and more money is pouring into research, as it has done over the last decades, more and more companies are also popping up, and they're building those machines for us because it's a massive market. And this means that A, the scientists don't know how the machines work anymore, and they don't know how to fix it, which is one problem. But the bigger problem is that they're really expensive. Right? If I want to buy a piece of plastic, which happens to have just the right shape, so I can do my experiment in a particular way, this will probably cost me $100 out of my research grant. Or if I want to buy a fancy microscope that can do something that other microscopes can't do, I probably pay $100,000 or more. So science really is expensive. Um, but luckily, especially in the last decade, what has happened is that consumer-oriented um, manufacturing has also come a long way. Things like 3D printing, things like um, microcontrollers. I can buy today for about two, $300 a 3D printer that works that can deliver me a good mechanical part 
that might be need, need, uh, useful for a particular scientific machine. And I can buy the electronics, or I can buy the blueprint for the electronics for maybe $10, maybe $20. So with a little bit of educating yourself on these kinds of techniques and a little bit of time on the hand, you can really build quite meaningful scientific machines for very low price. So for example here, this is a microscope. Um, and it looks reasonably fancy, but I will put to you that this is really quite cheap. So what we've got here is we've got a webcam and a little lens. costs about $15 together. In the bottom, we've got some LEDs and a bit of plastic to diffuse the light. And to hold the sample, we've got a 3D printed slide holder. So the whole thing can be put together for maybe 20, 30 euros, depending how you build it. So does it work? It works very well. So here we've got, in the top, we've got some parasites. You can see those in samples. You can count blood cells in a blood smear. Um, you can detect Schistosoma X. Schistosoma is a um, parasite that lives in freshwater lakes of Africa. Uh, it's a pretty big killer there. So clearly this is useful. Um, and you can go a lot further. If you go online, you will find a lot of these kind of um, building plans, open labware is what we call it. You can, you can look at them, you can build them, and then you can recreate them, try to contribute. So what we've now done is instead of continuing doing more and more science courses, which we do as well, We've also branched out into what we call a sort of Im into more applied courses, doing things like 3D printing, doing things like electronics. So here, what we see is a picture taken quite recently, actually, in Addis Abeba at our latest 3D printing course. So we've got an instructor here from Brazil, Andre, um, teaching two ladies from Cameroon how to build their own, the own 3D printer um, from parts that we picked up at a homeware store in Germany. We've had about two dozen students in this course from seven different African countries. Each of these formed groups, and they built a 3D printer and some other things, and then they took the 3D printer back with them to their home countries. So now, after this course, just from one course, we've got seven teams all over Africa, each with a 3D printer, not only knowing how to use it, but how to build it and how to repair it. And the hope, of course, is that these, in turn, will teach others. So, does it work? We've been now at this for about five years, and We've had a lot of different courses on a lot of different things. We've got hundreds of alumni. The question is, do these alumni use the skills for their personal gain or for their own scientific career, as it were, or do they, on top of that, go back into the population and teach about what they've learned? And I'm very happy to see that, indeed, this is really what's happening. They're going back into the population and they're teaching. So we've got now what's called the Trend Outreach Team. It's got about 20 or 30 members. Um, they're all young African scientists. They go back into their own schools. They go into their own universities. They talk to teachers and parents. They write open letters to governments, trying to get more science education into the African syllabus. And one thing that I particularly like about this, other than that the Africans are really taking their big future into their own hands, is that this really works. Suppose I would go into an African school and try to teach people about science. I'm not a believable role model. I, I haven't gone through the same process that these kids have gone through. right? These are scientists that really, they have the same cultural background, they speak the same language. Perhaps they're someone's older brother. They're really believable role models, and this is the sort of thing that will really get kids interested in science and, get, and generate the next generation of, of scientists in Africa. So the hope is that with this, this sort of scene will not seem such a distant future anymore. So I will finish with a Mandela quote, education, is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. Thank you.